I'm first going to say a few words of introduction uh, concerning the topic, and afterwards I'm going to introduce our speaker, Gary Young. Uh, so the topic uh, of imagining a world without borders actually developed out of courses which I'm teaching here in um, religions and world philosophies. And the first reason uh, is philosophical because in a course on world philosophies, we talked about utopias, uh, what kind of utopian visions were developed. Uh, and as you may know, a utopian vision is a vision of a world as it should be, of an ideal world, which is different from reality. And so I had this idea of um, a kind of mind game of um, thinking of what would happen uh, if a world without borders were created. Uh, would it, our world as it exists now and humanity as we know it now, would it be prepared for such a world? Or would it lead to chaos and killings and various other bad things? Uh, so the idea of a world without borders is a very complex um, idea uh, and it's complicated uh, to determine and concerns many different issues. Uh, for example, um, should one allow some immigrants to enter and others not? Then the question comes up, who is a good immigrant and who is a bad one? Um, how can one identify those who uh, are going to contribute to society and distinguish them from those who uh, have criminal reasons and might uh, commit terrorist acts. Also, one might ask, uh, is a borderless world more um, practicable in some regions of the world than in others? Um, so, Many different uh, aspects um, can be discussed from a philosophical perspective and we will hear more about this uh, by Gary Young soon. The other basis is historical. So as uh, you probably know, uh, borders as we know them today developed in connection with, the, with modern European nationalisms and the creation of nation states in the 19th century. But it was not the same in other historical periods. So the period I'm specializing on, late antiquity, was quite different. On the one hand, um, the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire were enemy empires who fought against each other. But nevertheless, people were able to move freely uh, between these regions. They could uh, go back and forth, um, for example, from Roman Palestine to Persian Babylonia without any hindrance. And you might ask what the reason for this is, and the reasons were probably that both the Romans and the Babylonians uh, were interested in trade, and they benefited from trade. Uh, so that was probably one of the reasons why they were keen on having this kind of exchange going on. Um, the next uh, reason um, for developing this topic uh, is personal. Um, as you can probably already hear from my accent, I was born in Germany and I'm now uh, what is in Germany called from a so-called migration background uh, because my father was a refugee from communist Hungary who eventually settled in Germany but decided to remain stateless. Uh, and so now this also leads me to contemporary issues because we are now um, in the development of uh, Brexit uh, and you have probably also uh, followed discussions about the Windrush scandal in the news. Uh, so now like many other EU nationals, uh, I ask myself, should I leave or should I go? Um, so on the one hand, uh, we are all um, used to uh, the internet where there are no borders and where we can make easy connections uh, to people worldwide and many professions, especially academic professions and sciences, develop, um, require professionals to be very mobile. But on the other hand, in Britain and also in many other European countries, especially for example in Hungary and Poland, uh, movements 
have developed which stress national identity uh, and an ideology which is very much based on the local, which seems almost retroactive, going back to some kind of earlier period of time. So uh, what could be the reasons for these developments in a world which has become so global nowadays? Um, so um, I'm very excited that uh, Gary Young, uh, the editor at large at The Guardian, was willing to talk about this topic. And he's actually my favorite uh, Guardian writer and also a reason why I'm a subscriber to the digital edition of The Guardian. Um, and he has published many very, very interesting articles on the topic of migration, immigration, uh, and immigrants from the Commonwealth nations in The Guardian recently. But he's not only a writer, but also a filmmaker. So some of you might be familiar with his documentary film about angry white Americans, where he explores possible reasons for Donald Trump's rise to power. And what I especially like is that he uh, tackles difficult subjects and he doesn't hesitate to, to really express what needs to be said uh, and also uh, expresses himself in a very clear and persuasive way. Uh, concerning this documentary, he also has a recent book uh, published by the name Another Day in the Death of America. Uh, he holds a number of honorary doctorates, for example, from Cardiff University and London South Bank University, and has received various awards and prizes for his journalistic work. Um, I look forward very much <laughs> uh, to welcome uh, Gary Young uh, and to <laughs> to hear what he has to say on our topic. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Catherine. Thanks uh, for having me. Just before I start, I'll um, uh, remind you, um, vote um, um, uh, today if they if they took away that right, you'd soon notice. Um, imagine that Martin Luther King never had a dream. Imagine instead that instead of thinking outside the narrow confines of his time and place, he'd resolved to work only within them. Imagine he had instead risen to the steps of the Lincoln Monument and announced a five-point plan that he thought he could both sell to the black community and win a majority for in both houses of Congress that would bring civil rights legislation that one step closer. But he didn't. He chose not to engage in the nitty gritty of the here and now and instead address not what will be or could be, but what should be. And it's in that spirit and tradition that I wanna make this contribution to the world turned upside down. I'm fully aware that no nation is going to get rid of its border tomorrow or even next year. And if you're looking for a discussion of workable immigration policies that can be enacted in this country or elsewhere within this parliamentary session or the next, then watch Question Time or listen to the Today programme. There you will find people going round in circles about what is practical rather than bothering themselves with what is ethical or moral. Idealism is the flesh on which pragmatic parasites feed. And it's not naive to hope that what is not possible in the foreseeable future is nonetheless necessary and worth fighting for. As a descendant of slaves and a child of an immigrant, working class, single parent family, I owe my life and my presence on this stage to those outrageous and brave enough to fight for a society that they insisted upon, even when they could not imagine it, ever materializing. If politics is the art of the possible, then radicalism must entail the capacity to imagine new possibilities. 
Oscar Wilde once wrote, a map of the world that does not include utopia is not worth even glancing at, for it leaves out the one country at which humanity is always landing. And, where humanity, and when humanity lands there, it looks out and sees a better country, and seeing a better country, it sets sail. The map of my utopian world has no borders. No border guards, no barbed wire, no passport control, no walls, fences or barriers. The world, I think, would be a better place without them. I believe in the free movement of people. As a principle, I think we should all be able to roam the planet and live, love and create where we wish. Now, I'm about to make the case for why I think that's desirable and what I believe we would need to be and do to get there, but I would throw down the gauntlet to those who oppose the notion of open borders for what place Yarlswood Detention Centre, Australia's dumping ground for asylum seekers in Nauru, or the jungle in Calais, or the vessels in the Mediterranean, what place do they have in your utopias? Why would you dream of them? So make no mistake, a world with open borders would demand a radical transformation of much of what we have now. It would demand a rethinking not only of immigration, but of our policies on trade and war, the environment, health and welfare, which would in turn necessitate a re-evaluation of our history and our understanding of ourselves both as a species and as a nation. This is partly personal for me. I am from a travelling people. My parents were born and raised in Barbados, a small island in the Caribbean, caught in the crosswinds of colonial ties and post-war labour scarcity. I have 14 aunts and uncles. Along with my parents, nine of them left Barbados for lives in Britain, the US and Canada. I have cousins scattered across the globe. Borders are no friends to diasporas. They privilege form-filling of a family. But borders exist by definition to separate one group of people from another and the primary two issues then become which other that will be and on what basis they should be separated. And as such they are both arbitrary borders and definite. Arbitrary because the borders could be drawn anywhere and they often move. They are, countries are in the words of Benedict Anderson, imagined communities. Indeed, nation states as we commonly understand them are a relatively new idea. We've made Italy, said uh, Massimo D'Aseglio at the first meeting of the newly united it Italy's infant parliament in the mid 19th century. We have made Italy, now we must make Italians. We have lived far longer without countries than with them. And if you look at what's happening in Catalonia or Scotland or Flanders, then some of the ones we are living with are far from being a settled fact. But if borders are arbitrary, they are definite, because wherever they are, we have to deal with them. And because the process that determines who is allowed to move where and why is exercised with extreme prejudice. America's 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act the white Australia policy, a series of measures lasting 70 years, or Britain's 1962 Commonwealth Immigrants Act are among the most crude filters. But while the othering changes with time, recently in the Western world, the shift from race to religion as grounds for suspicion over a generation has been breathtaking, the fact of it remains the same. Some people won't be welcome, not because of what they've done, but because of who they are, even if the groups of people in question may change. There was a Home Office report in 2007 about who gets stopped for extra questioning when coming into Britain, and it revealed that non-white South Africans are 10 times more likely to be pulled aside than, and non-white Canadians t nine times more likely to be pulled aside than their respective white countrymen. Moreover, even though when translated into sterling, the mean income of a black Canadian is almost double that of a white South African, a black Canadian is still four times more likely to be stopped than a white South African. So to anyone 
who seeks some other explanation, I point you to the faces of those who have been caught in the Windrush scandal and ask you if that is a coincidence. This is not a glitch in the system. This is the system. But it has rel relatively recently been compounded by a further contradiction, which is that even then, even as borders have become tougher for people, they have all but been lifted for capital. The world now operates according to the golden rule, and that's that those that have the gold make the rules. Money can travel the gold virtually without restriction in search of regulations that are weaker and labour that is cheaper. And when it does, it often displaces people, sucking investment and resources from one place at the flick of a switch, shutting down factories and shifting them to the other side of the globe, or introducing automation that renders some professions obsolete. But nobody asks a machine or money when it's crossing a border, will you put someone out of work? Those who find their lives turned upside down by the free movement of capital are often prevented from moving country and looking for work. People should at least have the same rights, or more, since I believe humans are more valuable than money, as machines. Sadly, that is not the prin a principle that underpins the system we live in. The rich can buy themselves citizenship, literally, in about 20 countries, cash down. Meanwhile, desperate people are turned away at borders all the time. It's a fact, rarely stated, but generally acknowledged and accepted, that the global poor should not be allowed to travel. Indeed, one of the more intriguing aspects of seeing Sajid Javid's life story, uh, the new Home Secretary, held up as an uh, uplifting example this week, is the detail that his father came to the country with just one pound in his pocket in 1961. That means, were his own father to arrive at Britain's borders now, Javid would not let him in. And he's okay with that. It's absolutely right, he said three years ago, that today we should have an immigration policy based more on skills. That's most of the world. As such, the border stands as an ultimate point of confrontation in the broader dystopia that we have made possible. I think poor people should be able to travel, not least because if they couldn't, I wouldn't be here. Now, in the time that remains, I want to dwell preemptively on the more obvious retorts regarding open borders. The first relates to security. If we open the borders, we will compromise our security, goes the claim. Well, the overwhelming majority of people who've committed terrorist attacks here were either born here or are here legally. That shouldn't surprise us. So long as Britain has had colonial or imperial interests elsewhere, it's had a terrorist problem here. We have been growing our own terrorists for years. For the best part of a century, um, we mostly were engaging with Ireland. And this, uh, our security that uh, resulted, uh, that came out of that conflict, emerged not as a result of tighter borders or more stringent policing, but from a political settlement. Similarly, the source of our terror problem isn't strong or lax borders, but a thoroughly misguided foreign policy in which we either commit acts of state terror ourselves, as in Iraq, or profit from the weaponizing of others to do it, as in Yemen. This would also help if we address this problem with the issue of refugees. First of all, we don't take anything like our fair share of refugees, even compared with other European countries, let alone the rest of the world. But what's particularly galling is because a, num a significant number of refugees are fleeing from wars that we've created and states that we have failed, regimes we subsidize and regions we have disabled. If you don't want people to come here, then maybe we could start by not going there and messing it up. Similarly, with our trade policies, which punish poorer countries by preventing them from developing as we did with nationalized industries protected by subsidies, and thereby confine them to the volatile markets of raw materials and the whims of multinationals. These are often countries which Britain and other Western nations actively and intentionally underdeveloped during colonialism. So there we have a historical responsibility. Much 
of the migration in the world at present, it should be pointed out, is not voluntary but forced by extreme poverty, natural disasters and wars. It would be a better world if people only moved if they wanted to and if they did not have to move to eat. Environmental policies, particularly on climate change, arms control and responsible foreign and trade policies would all assist in allowing many people to stay where they would rather be, at home. Put another way, those who insist that we cannot afford to take in the world's misery should make more of a concerted effort to ensure that we are not helping to create the world's misery. And that brings us on to the welfare state and the health service and so on, which is a tougher call. How do we sustain with national taxes these things that we value if they are then free to the world? Now, clearly, if we didn't contribute so much to global poverty, this would be less of an issue. But, uh, and we shouldn't forget the huge health inequalities within nations. A black man in Washington, D.C. has a lower life expectancy than a man on the Gaza Strip. But even then, um, just because you have no national borders doesn't mean that there can't be national rights and obligations. The pragmatist in me says we have free movement in the European, but I, uh, in the European Union so far, because we're still in it, but I'm still not eligible for an Italian pension. So ring fencing a system whereby those um, that contribute can benefit should not be uh, beyond our ken. That's a pragmatist in me. The idealist in me, though, asks the question, do you want to live in a world where healthcare is determined by an accident of birth? And if your answer is yes, is that because the accident occurred in your favour? But the thing that all of these caveats have in common, and I know there are more, is fear. A fear of others. That others might take what is ours, might pollute what we share. And that fear is a potent, potent force. It can drive people into the arms of fascists, racists, bigots and bullies. We have seen recently where that fear gets us. What happened with the Windrush generation was not a mistake. It was the whole point of the hostile environment policy. People are treated as illegal unless they can prove otherwise. Not content with a physical border on the water's edge and an airport frontier, it revealed that we now have borders that are invisible and omnipresent, dividing communities and generations at whim and will. The border now represents not a physical space, but a political one that can be reproduced without warning in places of learning and healing. At any moment, almost anyone, your boss, doctor, child's headmaster or landlord can become a border guard. Indeed, they may be legally obliged to do so. And on the basis of their judgment, you may be denied livelihood, family, home and health. Is that the world we want? The great thing about dreaming is that you always have something to wake up to. And I don't want to wake up to this anymore. Nation states are a relatively new concept. Migration is as old as humanity. Borders seek to regulate and restrict that basic human custom to travel for the distinct purpose of excluding some and privileging others. They discriminate between all people with the express intention of them being able to discriminate against some people. They do not simply set boundaries for countries, they are metaphors for how we might imagine other human beings. Immigrants are not the problem, borders are. Thank you. Well, that was a fantastic uh, discussion. It raised all kinds of questions. I'm going to exercise the chairman's prerogative and ask uh, the first one. How do we move from dystopia to utopia? You start with the smallest question, obviously. Um, I mean, arguably, for example, something like the European Union, um, and I know we weren't in Schengen, but nonetheless, that was the beginning of something, right? That was, that was a test case. And what we saw was that 
um, Greece or Portugal did not empty out, that not everybody left Poland or Romania, and that while um, uh, I think we as a country were not prepared and could have been prepared in terms of investment and social investment and so on, um, the sky did not fall in. The sky did not fall in. The problems that we have are not problems due to uh, uh, immigration, I believe. I don't think it was working class Romanians who traded in credit default swaps and crashed the economy. That's not the problem. So, um, uh, so I think that uh, we've had this experiment, and this experiment has, I believe, enriched us. I think Britain is a better, more interesting, more engaged place for having new and different uh, 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 people in it. And we went from 12 to 15 to 27 uh, countries. So I think for all of the problems that I have with the European Union, and I have many, um, that would be an example of how that move is possible. That's great. Ladies and gentlemen, Gary has kindly agreed to take some 20 to 25 minutes of questions. If your hand is recognized, wait for the roving microphone to come to you. Uh, say your name, and then please feel free to ask your question. Do we have anyone who wants to lead off from the audience with Yes, the gentleman with the glasses at the back there, please. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, I guess I have one quick question, which is, to what extent, in this country anyway, is some of the ills that you uh, diagnosed to do with the failures of social democracy um, over the 20th century, and to what extent do you think a kind of internationalism is ever possible within a social democratic party, particularly the Labour Party in this country? I mean, increasingly, I think it's, it's vital that I, I, I can't imagine what kind of programme you would have, social democratic or otherwise, that isn't internationalist because of the nature of both globalisation generally and neoliberal neo globalisation in particular. And that the problem with most social democratic responses to this moment has been um, the uncritical embrace of the free movement of capital and the very limited engagement with the free movement of, uh, of people. Uh, uh, so there's a range of ways in which you can tax transactions and have capital controls and a range of things that you can do about capital that everybody just threw their hands up and said, well, what are we going to do? They've got computers now. Uh, on the one hand. And then on the other hand, when it came to people, what they did was build bigger and bigger walls, employ more guards, Tony Blair stood at, you know, in Dover, uh, and what you had was a kind of um, uh, constant reiteration of uh, the muscular border. Okay. Another question, please. Yes, I think our pro director would like to ask a question. So I thought it would be really interesting to hear more about the role that borders play in that economic system, because the issue isn't that capital doesn't want flexible labour. It wants flexible labour with limited rights. It wants cheap labour. And labour becomes cheap when, um, you know, when, um, when people feel insecure when they're desperate for jobs and when they don't have social rights and I guess that's the problem of getting to your vision of um, utopia we're not just looking at a system that's created by racism or by um, social forms of exclusion but one that's really premised on economic success yeah I think um, econ economics really shapes the narrative and then race, ethnicity, religion just describes the protagonist within that narrative at any, um, at any given moment. But in a sense, to kind of combine some of the question that uh, the young man asked with, with yours is that if you do have um, laws against capital dumping so that 
people can't have predatory, um, uh, people can't say, right, we're going to go to Ireland because they have no minimum wage, or, I mean, they do, but, you know, or, or whatever. We're going to go here because labour is, is weak, and that's the kind of thing that we can do. People can, you know, can, that is possible. Uh, uh, instead of what you have is a kind of race to the bottom in which uh, everybody ends up competing with whoever the kind of least secure group of people are in, uh, in the world and then blaming them for it. Um, and, um, and that's, you know, that's not acceptable. And, it, and what we've had in Britain and uh, I think why immigration has been become the kind of issue that it has in Britain is because for too long we pursued a low productivity, low wage, low skilled uh, economy. And then we're surprised when the kind of people who want to come to Britain and work are um, that a significant proportion of them have low skills. Well, that's the kind of economy we have, and that's not inevitable. We can do something, we could do something, um, uh, we could do something about that. But the, the skill in the, in the racism, I think, is diverting people's attention from the economic to the ethnic, religion, or racial, and kind of saying, well, that must be them. They must be, they, they have, you know, they are, the reason why your library is closing down. They are the reason why you can't get a place in school. Uh, and, and diverting our attention from the broader economic framework. Okay. Another question. Uh, Felix at the back there, please. Um, thank you. Um, I, I was wondering if you could say something about the place of a political system in your utopia. How do you imagine um, the places where political deliberations and decisions are taking place? Um, is it a layered system from the local to the global? How does it work? Um, so that would be my question. I mean, in my utopia, as much Anything that can be devolved would be devolved, and there would be there would be a range of things that you can't devolve, you know. Um, but that um, uh, the things that are more local are more accessible, are more kind of meaningful. When I when I've done work in Scotland, um, you can really see how. The size of Scotland and the and the the accessibility of its parliamentarians, and so for example, Scotland has been incredibly successful in tackling knife crime, and the reason one of the reasons that they've been successful, I believe, is because there were the political unit was um, small enough to that people could pick up the phone to someone and say, why don't we do this? And so it could move at a pace that I think uh, England or Britain um, uh, couldn't. So I think wherever it's possible to devolve power, uh, we should, not least because as time goes on, within nation states, regional variations become so vast that you know London could really have more in common with, I don't know, New York or Berlin or something than it could with, uh, with Shropshire, then all the more reason for Shropshire not to be taking too many orders from London. Um, so that's, that would be my vision for it. Okay, I think Catherine in the front here has a question. Uh, here, Professor Hirza. Um, since the 1970s, uh, Britain has become so much more a multicultural society. 
And yet, since Brexit, attacks on the Muslim and Jewish population have increased. So, what I find difficult to understand is that how people with whom one has lived for, for decades, also in connection with the Windrush generation, are suddenly seen as others. Mm. And sadly, it wasn't that sudden, I think. I mean, we... Um, I would say that we were not doing as well as we thought we were. I was deluded. And I didn't think, I didn't think Britain was, you know, fantastic, had solved it, was... But I thought that we were further ahead in terms of educating the general populace, that we, we were further ahead than we were. And it seems that many of the gains that we made were fragile, um, uh, much more fragile, certainly than I believed, but I think than many others. Uh, I, I think there are others who have been shocked, not by the fact of it, but by the scale of it, the nature in which people now feel emboldened to say s certain things that it wouldn't have surprised me if they'd thought it, but what surprises me is that they are bold enough to say it. One of the things that I found really intriguing and, and clarifying in the wake of Brexit was the, mean, the, 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 the ease with which people moved from the xenophobic to the racist and the Islamophobic. That there was no suggestion that um, um, women wearing hijabs were in any way involved in the debate about Europe, right, in t as it was understood, of Polish, Romanian, uh, Bulgarian, that's what that debate was ostensibly about. And yet, you didn't have to scratch the surface very hard after the uh, vote to see that the, um, um, the xenophobia against a certain kind of other slid very easily from uh, uh, language to religion and race. And that for a while, and I don't think this will be true forever, the Poles and the Romanians and the Bulgarians were black people, that they had become racialized. Now they were, I mean, uh, that's obviously talking about black as a political color, not as an actual color, but they were the audible other. And that um, to, to, if people heard them speak in the street, they were vulnerable. People didn't know whether they should speak their own language. Maybe in some areas they still, uh, they still don't. In a couple of cases, people were killed when they were heard to be speaking uh, uh, a different language. And, um, um, but I think that the, the, that canary was always in the mind if we look at how UKIP had been doing uh, in the years prior that um, um, it had always it had always been there, but this gave it a lease of life. Uh, yes, uh, the lady at the white uh, top there, please. I was just wondering, in your idea of utopia, do you envisage there being one global currency? If it was a real utopia, I would, uh, I would envisage there just being no money. Just <laughs> money, just stuff. Um, um, you know what, I can't, that's not, money isn't in my utopia, in my head. When, when I, um, the trouble with there being one kind of money is that money needs to be regulated. I'm, I'm not a big fan of the euro because there's absolutely no democracy within the institution that governs that currency. And if someone's gonna put up my mortgage, I wanna be able to get my hands on them, or at least be able to remove them. Wherever there's, powerful, wherever there's power, it should be accountable. And there is a severe lack of accountability in the European Central Bank. And so to have a global currency, you would have to have a global organization that could work that currency. And, um, uh, that seems like a tall order to me. Okay. The gentleman in the front here, please. Thank you. Um, I think it's fair to say that SOAS is a university with a strong activist tradition. So just 
following up on the question um, from the back there about um, sort of political solutions and ways forward, do you see what kind of role do you see activism playing in um, moving towards your utopia? Uh, every role that kind of you know is it Martin Luther King who said the the arc um, the arc of justice is long but tends towards progress I'm mashing that up a bit but um, it doesn't bend by itself none of this stuff happens by itself and when we think of the things that we do have we have them because we fought for them you know it's a constant frustration to me and it's been intriguing it's been very intriguing this whole windrush thing has been kind of very intriguing to me on a number of levels not least because it coincided with the 50th anniversary of the Enoch Powell speech um, and um, uh, 25 years since uh, Stephen Lawrence's uh, murder and a whole lot of other things that there is this belief that British tolerance and fair play is a product of our genius. We're just decent bloody people. And that's, the, you know, that's the truth of it. How could we not be? When the fact is that all of this stuff has been fought for and that if it hadn't been fought for, and because it's been fought for, it could be lost and we have to keep on fighting, but also that there were people who resisted it. So this notion that the, the Windrush generation are now this benighted generation somewhere around the kind of Queen Mum or Mother Teresa as a kind of fabulous national treasure. Well, if only that had been true at the time, you know, and that is, they, you know, they suffered a huge amount of racism and, the, and, and it was activism that's got us to this point. And what is truly fascinating about this moment is that people can keep in their heads these two things. On the one hand, here's a group of old black immigrants who paid their taxes, contributed to the country, made the country better. All of these things which are readily accepted even by the Daily Mail. And then on the other hand, here's this other group of immigrants who are taking things away, lowering our wages, making everything worse, ruining the country. How can that be? How can you keep those two things in your head at the same time? And it's activism that we don't know what the future holds, but we do know that if we don't fight for our version of it, that it won't exist. And so uh, activism is, is the key. And if you, if you go to the States at the moment and you speak to most of the liberals I've spoken to um, while reporting, they're all doing things now that they didn't do even two years ago because they feel they were asleep at the wheel and that that they let this happen. And, um, you know, bad things happen when good people stay at home. So, go vote. Uh, yes, um, the lady in the center here, please. In the very brightly designed T-shirt. Do you think a world without borders would also abolish a class system? Sadly not, no, no. Um, uh, it's a good question, and um, I would like that too. That would be a different talk though. <laughs> um, um, no, what you'd be doing is, is, is opening not just the thing that's often not said about kind of um, uh, when it comes to immigration is that pretty much, with, with a few exceptions, if you happen to come from a country that's been banned for whatever reason, rich people can travel anywhere in the world and Western people can travel anywhere in the world, which is why it's a difficult concept for Western people because we, we have open borders, just not for them. And so... Um, there is a class issue here, which is that poor people can't travel. Poor people are not allowed to travel. And that's accepted. That's what Sajid Javid is saying when he says, I wouldn't let my dad in. He's, well, no, because he's poor and we don't want poor people no more. And, um, uh, and, not, and, and that's said and it's accepted. And if we look once again at these Windrush stories, they're working class people. Wealthier people could 
get a lawyer on the case or would have engaged with the system at some other point because um, uh, because they wanted to travel or something. These are people who, um, and it's a key point this, that when confronted, people thought there is no consequence to me denying you your benefits, denying you your job, denying you your health care. What are you going to do? You're an old black lady, you're an old black man. That is all part of the mindset that, that makes this particular group um, uh, vulnerable. So I do think that it's, um, it's a class issue, but I don't think you get rid of class by, by um, opening the borders. Uh, yes, in the center here, the gentleman in the gray jacket, please. Hi, um, thanks for a very stimulating conversation. But up till now, the, the discussion has all been about kind of presuming the flow has been from the rest of the world to Europe. And of course, migration and immigration takes place all over the world by poor people. Um, uh, Colombia has just closed its borders to Venezuela because of the mass immigration fleeing that um, dreadful economy. Um, but I just wondered how you imagine um, a world without borders, the effect on the rest of the world, not just on Europe? Well, a lot of the rest of the world um, often does have quite porous borders, right? If you look at where the lion's share of um, uh, refugees and asylum seekers are, they, uh, it's not that those countries don't have borders, but that they are relatively... Um, uh, they don't have places like the jungle in Calais. Do you know what I mean? They don't. Th th that's not uh, um, the problem. And my experience of people moving around uh, some parts of the world, like if you're in the Caribbean and you want to go from one Caribbean country to the other, that is uh, is fairly easy. It's much more difficult if you want to go from Zimbabwe, for example, or or a, a poor African country to. South Africa, but then South Africa I would kind of consider to be a bit more like Britain in that um, in 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 that regard. So wherever one would have open borders, there would be the challenge of how how do you cope how do you cope with this uh, flow of um, how do you cope with this flow of people? But if you have people fleeing tyranny, then it actually it's international law that you've got to let them in. I mean, that's, that's, that's law. And then the, the problem there would be, do you have the international capacity to actually engage with that tyranny? Which, of course, we don't. Um, but I think that's a different question. If, if we look at Syria or um, uh, Afghanistan or places where people are legitimately fleeing awful things. We don't, we have a structure within the UNHCR, within the UN, but we have a structure that most powerful countries don't really respect. And if more powerful countries were doing their bit, then there would be a bigger distribution of those people who are, who are fleeing uh, those things. But actually, I think in an awful lot of the world, um, the borders are less definite and more understood to be arbitrary, not least because the people who live within them didn't actually draw them. And so the kind of movement between various bits of West African countries, I think, is quite, is, is, um, is quite fluid. Um, uh, so I think it, it very much depends on where you mean, and it very much depends on why people are moving. But that if we had international, if we had the kind of international structures, if we had the kind of international enforcement of the international policies and policies and structures that exist, we could, uh, most of the world could cope with this. Okay, we've got time for, I think, one more question. And I think I want to keep this as gender equal as possible. So can we have a uh, lady here, please? Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, talking about arbitrary borders, obviously you can think about borders within a nation state as well as around and dividing the 
between other nation states. I was just wondering about how you feel we can reconcile the border that seems to have been drawn between London and most of the rest of the UK or south and north within the UK and how you see that kind of developing in the future and what solutions you see we could work towards? Um, I mean, it's been, I, I was in America for 12 years and I only came back three years ago. Um, and I was quite shocked just by what London had become in terms of um, um, price, inequality, stress, um, uh, and, and this might be partly my personal story. I didn't have kids when I left, so I might be stressed about prices because I got kids. But um, I don't think uh, um, I, I don't think that's all it is. Um, Britain is horribly imbalanced, and that's you know you don't have to spend ten minutes in this city if you've been anywhere else in the country to kind of understand that. I do think, and, and some of this came from the work I was doing on knife crime, that if we had that regional government in this country would be a really good thing. That the conversation, just as an example, the conversation that we're having about knife crime, that we should be having about knife crime in London, is very, very different to the one that they should be having in Wolverhampton in the West Midlands, which is very different, again, than the one that they were having in Scotland. Um, and that it would really help to break that conversation up, not least because the national conversation we're having is dishonest and is mostly kind of um, disfigured by a kind of overwhelming concentration on, on, on London. Um, and then London, the, the other problem is that London becomes not just a place, but a metaphor. And the metaphor is misleading because it, it is assumed that London means uh, rich and powerful and connected in the kind of national conversation, you London metropolitan types and so on and so forth. When actually a huge amount of London is none of those things, but actually kind of some of the most poor, uh, least connected, people that you'll, that you'll find in the, uh, in, the, in the country. And so the way that London dominates the conversation, the national conversation, is not just bad for the country, it's actually really bad for London. So the more, uh, uh, and this speaks to the uh, other question about politics, the more regional governments and citywide governments, one, uh, polities that we can have, I think, the better. Now, you don't want to build up layer upon layer upon layer of, of uh, uh, bureaucracy, but increasingly, as I was saying earlier, it does feel like um, the Northeast is having a conversation that might, maybe, and now I'm just picking stuff, you know, I'm just making stuff up, but it might be closer, the Northeast might be having a conversation that's closer to Slovenia, whereas London's having a conversation that's more, you know, is kind of more going to be closely tied to kind of Madrid or Paris or something. And that they should be, uh, they should be allowed to have those conversations. Uh, and at the moment, they're not really. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had a very stimulating uh, discussion and I'm afraid it's time to wind up. We've been talking mostly about utopia from a British perspective. Uh, in a way, we've enclosed ourselves. But when you look at Gary's writings, his columns, he has always approached things not only from the perspective here, but from international situations. I think that some of his articles written on the American situation have become legendary. I have South African friends who talk about them all the time. It's interrogation of the terrible othernessing that's going on in the United States, for instance, and appreciated by friends in South Africa because precisely they're trying to emerge from exactly that kind of situation of apartheid where people were officially othered and there was nothing that they could do about it. We're facing a worldwide problem, a global problem, 
which very few public intellectuals in this country are prepared to grapple with. One of the hugely honorable exceptions is Gary. But I think that he raises all kinds of major questions which are touched upon in your question, for instance, about an activist community. SOAS is a very activist community. It's one of the most diverse universities in Europe, and it certainly has the most diverse faculty in all of Europe. And we keep wondering what is it that we fail to do by way of contributing new ideas to exactly these problems. So it's a responsibility that comes to left and right. The implicit, I think, question that is left hanging in the air from Gary's talk and from many of his columns is, is there a global failure of the left in general to come up with new, imaginative, and vibrant, practical ideas to move towards utopia, to move away from dystopia? Ladies and gentlemen, we have very few public intellectuals in this country in any case, very few that write with the elegance and the articulate expression of provocative ideas as Gary does. Reading his columns in The Guardian is always a source of immense pleasure to myself and I'm sure to many of you. He's taken time out of his very busy schedule to talk to us tonight. I'm sure we're going to beg for him to come back. To encourage him to come back, why don't we thank him in a rousing fashion. Thank you.